here broadcasting live from Inner Atlantic Commerce office grounds to report the tragic events that occurred this afternoon. We are some of the first to arrive at the crime scene and so far we can only say that the victim, a young woman, has not been identified. We will continue to update you as we get more information on this brutal accident. Hello, I am Marco Martin. And I'm Miriam Kocha. And today, we find ourselves in the middle of a fresh crime scene. So we will show you how to collect, protect, and ensure that the evidence will be useful to solve this mystery. But before we continue, I must inform you that we will be handling sensitive topics, so we, we will ask you for complete discretion. When crime scene technicians arrive at a crime scene, they are not the first. Before them, actually, firefighters and life rescue get there. Their job is to secure the witness and ensure to save the lives of those in danger. Law enforcement also arrives at the crime scene first. They are the ones who set up the yellow tape that has been popularized in social media. As the crime scene is investigated, we might discover that a bigger area is also part of it. This results in the yellow tape having to be moved further away to ensure that all the evidence is preserved. Here, another team is setting up the drone to record the crime scene. We launch a drone to obtain a nice and accurate view of the area. The footage and pictures collected from the drone will allow us to later increase the accuracy of the crime scene sketch that we will have to make. These aerial views will also help us locate entrances and exits to the crime scene, along with sections that cannot be reached with satellite imaging. While the drone process is taking place, we want to jumpstart into the crime scene. We have a lot of work to do. We need to secure the area, pick which mapping method we want to use, properly select all the type of evidence we want to collect, properly collect the evidence, safely secure it, and send it back to the crime lab. We do have a lot to do, so let's begin as soon as possible. However, we cannot step into the crime scene until we change into the appropriate personal protective equipment. Let's change. Our personal protective equipment cover all our body. We need a hairnet to ensure that our own hairs are not mistakenly collected, and a face mask to both protect ourselves from the smell of the crime scene and the crime scene from our facial hair and saliva. A body suit to prevent both our own hairs and clothes fabrics from contaminating the scene, gloves that protect our fingerprints, and shoe nets to prevent dirt from our shoes to contaminate the crime scene. This is not your most comfortable outfit. But however, it is not made for comfy. This is a high level protection and it's actually a two way ticket to protection. It both protects us from the crime scene and protects the crime scene from the contamination that we take to it. Before we step into the crime scene, we need to pick a right mapping method that we're going to follow to collect all the evidence to ensure that we don't miss one single bit. Let me show you some mapping methods. As shown in this image, the grid method divides the crime scene into multiple small paces that are walked perpendicularly it is best suited for outdoor crime scenes where the evidence might be scattered in a large area. The spiral method, also known as the ray search method, starts in the center of the crime scene and it spreads around it. It is more commonly used when the crime scene has a central point of interest. The line search method is more commonly used when there is a team of investigators who search a large elongated area like the woods. And the strip method, the one that we will be using for this crime scene, involves dividing the area into a small and narrow strip that will be walked back and forth looking for evidence. It will involve the help of two crime scene technicians or simply one. Another benefit of this method is that it allows you to thoroughly walk a crime scene that is small to ensure that all evidence is collected. This is also the perfect opportunity to videotape the crime scene. Let us show you how. I'm going to go in the front numbering all the evidence that I encountered. I'm also going to take notes of all that evidence, so later I can make a good sketch of the crime scene. I'm gonna go behind him, since I cannot see as well. 
and I don't want to damage any evidence. Let's go. From what I noted in the crime scene, I drew this rough cage. This is the first of many. So do not worry if yours does not look perfect. That is not what we are looking for here. The main point I want to achieve with this sketch is to categorize the main pieces of evidence that are present in the crime scene. The evidence that is listed here is and will not be the only evidence that will be collected. As we go into the crime, we might find more evidence that we missed on our first walk. If you did not notice it, I am going to tell you what just happened in just this first walk. I did not only notice all the eight main pieces of evidence that are relevant at the moment, but I also could narrow down the scene of the crime to this corner of the courtyard. This is going to help us a lot, and we will be looking more into detail to this particular zone. Just because we place numbers on each type of the evidence, it doesn't mean that we have to collect them in numerical order. This is just to keep track of the stuff we have to do. What we want to start with are these papers over here because they might get wet with the blood of the crime scene or they might get blown away. As we can see here, we have three checks. We mark them as evidence number two. And over here, we have a folder. We marked it as evidence number three. What we're going to do is we're going to collect them separately. So to do so, I'm going to start with the checks. Give me the scale. I'm going to take an individual picture of each one of the checks. Once we have taken a picture of the check we want to collect, we can proceed to pick it up. You see it's already flying away. I'm going to get a Ziplo bag and I'm going to place it inside. I'm going to make sure it's not folded and I do not rip it away by any chance. Now, I am going to seal the evidence. I get a little bit of the air off, completely seal the Ziplo bag. Fold it right here, and I'm going to take the seal, and I'll place it right here. This seal contains all the important information. We have the number of the case, the number of the evidence that was collected, the date where the evidence was collected, the time, and my signature. Now, let's move on into our third piece of evidence, the file. To do so, I'm first gonna hand her the evidence I already collected, so we secure it. I'm going to place the scales next to the folder, and I'm going to ask her to take a close-up picture of the folder, and a far-away picture too, please. So we get a sense of where the folder was located with respect to the crime scene. And the close-up picture is that, so that we get a sense of what was surrounding the folder and in which conditions we found it followed by the pictures with the scale, I'm going to use the same method I used for the checks. I'll get a Ziplo bag, I'll carefully collect it, and I'll place it inside the Ziplo bag. I make sure it seals, and I put the seal. The second evidence that we want to collect as soon as possible is this blood pattern right here. We, there's a lot of information that we can retrieve from it, but we have to do it as soon as possible. As you can see here, mainly all the blood that was located in this blood pool dried off. But right here in the center, right in front of the column, there is more blood because there was a bigger accumulation of blood, so it has taken a longer time to dry off. So what I'm going to do, I'm gonna take my gauze, hold it, and put it in to try to retrieve as much blood as possible. Now, carefully, I'm going to get some paper right there, and I'm going to place it in the inside. Because this blood has been present here for so long, we want to send it to the lab as soon as possible. Therefore, we're not gonna have time to let it dry out in room temperature as we should. You should never transport wet blood inside a plastic bag. So we want to collect them, wrap them around this paper, and then proceed to make, put them inside our bag. The paper that we put is what we call a primary envelope. And the bag is the actual envelope for the evidence. 
The primary envelope works as a method of securing that the blood is not gonna drip or transfer throughout the paper. As always, I fold it and I place the seal. Now, very important about a blood spatter. We want to take as many pictures as possible from different angles, from different positions, from above, from below, from all the possible points. So we later in the crime lab can determine what happened and what generated this blood spatter. What we want to follow up is with our victim. We want to properly secure and retrieve all the evidence that we can gather from her as soon as possible so we can send her to the medical examiner's office. She died on a, laying on her left side with her right arm in a very angled position. This is very common in cases where the victim died in the process of defending themselves with their arm like this. You can also see that right there, she's missing one shoe. As well, we can also see in her face that she has multiple bruises. She has a black eye with a bruise under her eye, and she has a strong, very big blow in the top of her head. This is common in cases where there's signs of struggle or some type of fight. There's also a lot of blood around her shirt. To properly ensure that all the evidence is collected from the body of the victim, we will have to undress her. Step by step, we will take off her clothes collect all the items present in their pockets, and catalog all the information that we can retrieve from them. This process also includes having to photograph all the items that are retrieved and the clothes that are taken out of the victim before bagging them. To properly get all evidence that we could possibly get out of her, we're going to have to undress her. We're I, going to... I didn't sign up for this. Hey, but... No, but no. I, didn't, I didn't sign up for that. No, but listen, this is something that we have to do. No, this is I'm the not doing that on camera. We need to get all free. the process... Oh my god, we need to get all no. out of your packets. Obviously, to the we're not doing that right now. So let's move on. Our next piece of evidence is this rock. It was found near the body, which is very important to notice. To record all that information, we're going to place a scale and we're going to take a close up picture so we get a dimension of how big the rock is and where it was found. And the further away picture is going to give us a correlation on how close from the body the rock was found and in which area of the crime scene the rock was found. At the moment, as you can see, all the blood that was pressing in this rock is dried. So I cannot bother into recording any type of blood that I could retrieve from this rock because it's already dried. So what I will do is just, I'll just collect it and I'll send it to the lab so they there can collect some blood out of it and they can do all the examinations that they need. To do so, I'm going to get my paper bag, open it, I'll get the rock. There is no need in this case for a primary envelope, which was the tissues that we use for the other scenario with the blood, because this blood is dry. It's not going to go through our envelope. I fold it and I place the seal. For our last piece of evidence, we see two trails here. They are two distinct trails, so we will be documenting them separately. We will take close pictures of them and far away pictures of them. They were right next to the rock, so we will see what relevance this has to the case. Moving on, we don't have to go far for our next, next piece of evidence. Let's take a look at the tray of blood that we can see all over here, all to the, where the rock was present, which is very close to where the victim was found. This is very relevant, and all of this will be documented on the sketch that we make of the crime scene. It will be documented with pictures, with proper scale, and it will be documented on notes. Notes are very important. They write, we have to write information that we might forget later. Our last piece of evidence, funny enough, is the evidence that we cataloged as evidence number one. This shows you that we don't have to pick up the evidence in a numerical order. We just pick them as we find fit and as it's most convenient for us in the process of conserving the evidence. This is clearly a shoe 
I'm not gonna, I, I, didn't, I didn't bother into collecting it earlier because nothing is gonna happen to it. It's not gonna decompose, it's not gonna go fly away. So there's no problem in leaving it behind and paying more attention to the other evidence which needed to be attended first. So the shoe, I'm normally gonna pick it up. I'm going to place it inside the bag and I'm gonna close the bag with the seal. Something important to notice, in the notes of this, where I picked up the evidence, I always make notes. I'm not gonna add on the notes that they should belong to anyone because I cannot make conclusions about anything that happens in the crime scene. I am just here to document the process, to document what I found, but I cannot make conclusions. Conclusions are made after all the analysis are performed. The shoe must be sent to the forensic identification section to determine if it comes from the victim or someone else. The blood that we retrieve from the blood pool will have to be sent to the DNA section. Blood patterns are analyzed at the crime scene by both detectives and crime scene technicians. In special cases, they could consult blood stain pattern specialists who will view the pictures of the patterns or view it all the crime scene. The blood that was pressing here will be sent to the DNA section. The rock will also have to be sent to the DNA section to determine if the blood present comes only from the victim. These trails will be analyzed at the crime scene and photographed to later be consulted by detectives. While the victim will be sent to the medical examiner's office. Her clothes will have to go to the trace evidence section of the crime lab to determine if there is any fibers or her present on them. And both the checks and the file must be sent to the question document examiner in the forensics identification section of the crime lab. Disclaimer! These sections only apply to the labs of the Forensic Science Division of the Miami-Dade County Police Department. Other counties or other states have different organization of their crime lab, so this may not apply to all of them. After all the evidence was properly collected, we will still do another walkthrough of the crime scene. We're gonna map the crime scene again. We're gonna make sure that we did not leave anything behind, that there is not any little trace evidence left behind. And if there is so, we will repeat the same process. We will catalog it, secure it, uh, put it in an envelope, and send it together with the other evidence. This will be all for today. As always, we hope this helped you become a better crime scene technician. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye. Bye. We want to secure the evidence. No. Okay, I got distracted. Ooh. Angry. And then after I say, and we're gonna return. Harry are now mistakenly collected. Mariam, don't. What the? How are you gonna lift it? Sin. So we will show you how to protect. Pero Marco. Marco. Just because we place numbers on each type of evidence, it doesn't mean, mommy, let's go. Well, how am I supposed to know if you don't tell me, Marco? They, because you're going to be paying attention to me. No, I'm not. I'm not looking at you. I'm looking oh, at the camera. But you should be looking at me, too. Stop being stupid. This is where I get a sense of the crime scene so I can draw a sketch of it. We need a shoe here. And it never happened. Come here, mama. I, I, you know, I'm, gonna use I'm coming for you. <laughs>